Hello and welcome to my talk about real-time communication with PowerShell and SignalR and Azure Functions. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for having me today and for organizing this conference and for organizing this conference as a virtual conference after uh, the original conference cannot take place as planned. Next, I want to thank the sponsors of this year's PowerShell conference. First of all, Microsoft for always paying all their employees to join the PowerShell conference and for Jeffrey Snover for doing a keynote every year since I think the beginning on. And yeah, System Frontier, Script Runner and PowerShell One as well. Thanks for your sponsoring. So let's talk about today's agenda. First we take a look at the idea, then we will talk about the technologies involved, so especially the Azure services that we will use for this project. Then we will take a short look at the architecture and finally we have a summary with uh, a few more or less serious lessons that you can uh, take away from this talk. So first of all, let us start with the idea. So the idea initially came when I created an application to show off uh, Signal R capabilities with a colleague of mine, but he wrote it in C Sharp. And we already did this demo in uh, Azure, so with Azure services, but Azure functions themselves were running just C Sharp code, so uh, C Sharp binaries mainly, and I thought, why not do it in PowerShell and why, why not use it to show other people how you can leverage Azure Functions and Azure Native Services to create serverless application for real-time messaging. So the idea basically is to create an application called Session Feed. We just made the name up and Session Feed itself just provides a chat, um, so a thread-based chat with some comments for participants to ask questions during a talk and finally do some votes. Although the voting is not implemented, it should give you an idea how an application could look like. So we will focus on the chat because the chat itself is the interesting part when it comes to real-time communication. And the chat itself is completely based on Signal R, connected uh, with WebSockets from the browser client. For the client, so for, for the web front end, we will use uh, Vue.js based uh, front end. We will not go too deep into that because uh, this is about PowerShell and not about uh, Vue.js. So I just created a very simple front end in, in Vue.js to show the signal R messaging capabilities and it's interesting for us later on to see um, how the messages flow in WebSockets and uh, when new messages appear and so on. Um, yeah, the whole backend is basically serverless, so we have Azure Functions, we have the Azure Signal R service, and we have a few other backend services that we will soon uh, take a look at. And yeah, so let's start with taking an action look at the final result, as uh, the final application. So, how should it look? if you open up session feed and how should it behave and how should users be able to interact. Let's switch over to the browser and open session feed. Let's take a look at our example app called session feed. Session feed is running locally on my machine using a view dev server. I just fired it up, um, ran yarn dev and now I have my application running on localhost on port uh, 3000. I also uploaded it to a static website on an Azure storage account, but I don't really need that now. I only use it to validate that everything works as expected with the production build basically and with an URL that is reachable from all over the world. So the first thing we see here is that we are already logged in with our PowerShell hero. We see that with uh, our profile and our profile picture and this is a default user that we will use throughout this demo to create threads. So the expected behavior is that I can create a question here and the question can get answered by other people or you can also add your own messages to this. 
So let's just add a thread and I think PowerShell Hero would be interested in what technologies are used here. So let's just submit this question and we see it appear just a few um, moments later. So this is about a second of delay I think and it's pretty impressive if you imagine that this message has just passed all our serverless stack including Cosmos DB, Azure Functions and Signal R. But we will see in a few minutes how this all comes together. So this is our thread and now we can add some comments here. But first of all, let's check if our thread also appeared on the other side. So we have another browser session here. I opened another browser window and it is also connected via WebSockets and uh, Signal R to our chat stream. So, so uh, we should see all our updates appearing in both uh, browser windows. So I will add a comment here. So I select the thread so that the submit comment button will be available and I will just yeah say which technologies are used. The used technologies are Signal R service, Azure Functions, Cosmos DB and of course PowerShell. And let's post this. So we see this time the message appeared directly here because I just used a little bit different method for updating all, the, all of this. I just disabled all the loading logic here so that everyone can see how much time it actually takes um, a message to loop through all of the infrastructure. So normally when you would create an application like this you would have the submit button and would have some kind of loading indicator. So after I submit a question maybe the button will be disabled and a small like loading circle will appear something like that. But like I said I have disabled everything here so we can see exactly how long it takes for messages to go through our serverless stack. What we see is that we have an answer here. So the default uh, persona that I use to um, submit comments is myself. So um, this, uh, this is the only reason why my picture and my name appears here. And let's just see how this works uh, the other way around. So thanks for the information. This will also appear under my name because like I said, I just uh, hard-coded the persona for all the threads to be our PowerShell hero and for all the comments to be myself. So, okay, this is basically it. We can add more threads and more questions here. So, like question two, just submit it. We can also like these questions and we can also add more comments to all of our questions. So you've seen that the question also appear here and that shows us that our signal R and WebSocket connection is up and running and it takes about, yeah, let's, let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, okay, I haven't updated the browser, but it took about five seconds, I think. So. This is very long, let's try it again. Question four, submit question. Let's see how long it takes this time. Yeah, that was much faster. Okay, like I said, that's it for the moment. So you've seen that there are messages be pushed out from a single client and they appear on the second client. And now we take a look at how this looks in the background. So let me just open up the browser debugging tools. These are the browser debugging tools of uh, Microsoft Edge, the new Edge version powered by Chrome, by the Chrome engine, sorry. <laughs> And what we will do is to uh, is that we will reload the page first, so we get all the network calls. And the interesting network call here, um, so the first one 
is actually negotiate. So we will come to that in a moment, but negotiate is just the negotiation endpoint for signal R. And based on the return of this negotiate endpoint, the browser created a new session, a new signal R WebSocket session. And with the built-in inspector, we can actually see all the messages that are going through this. So the first thing we realize is that there is some kind of initialization going on here. So we have an initialization as soon as the client is connected with what it seems like all the different threads that are active right now and so that they can all be displayed in this pane. Yeah, this is the initialized thread and let's see how it looks um, or what actually happens when we submit a new question. So we will add another question. We see that there is first a call to the thread endpoint. We have a thread endpoint at session feed service so Azure websites v1 thread and this thread is called um, this endpoint is called with a post request. We can also take a look at the body down here. So we have an author tag, uh, we have the creation date, we have our ID and we have some other information. Great. So what happened in our WebSocket now? So after we sent the request to our thread endpoint, it made all the loops through our serverless infrastructure and then magically it created a new thread signal, a new thread message on our WebSocket stream. So there's a new message in our uh, WebSocket data. It's called uh, new thread. It has type one and the arguments are the contents of the thread itself. So we have the thread, the author, the creation date and so on. Okay. Great, let's go back to the PowerPoint and see which technologies are used underneath. This was our first demo of Session Feed and now let's talk about serverless in a nutshell. I just want to give a small primer why we choose to um, do serverless here and why we choose to create a serverless architecture to showcase how we can use PowerShell in all of this. I use serverless or I explain serverless to people like all the time with this analogy that first we had virtualization with virtual machines before we had servers. After virtualization we had uh, like containerization and after that we had microservices and the even smaller instance compared to microservices are functions. So functions as a service, serverless, whatever you want to call it. I think FAAS is uh, yeah, the best description for the technology itself is just um, a technology that lets you create code on the function level. So you only write a function and everything else, so like scaling and um, integrations and all the runtime, the hosting, it's all taken care for you. So this is what Azure Functions actually brings to the... That is what Azure Functions brings us in this scenario. But serverless itself is more than just serverless functions. So serverless um, architectures are really good for modern web applications, if you have single page applications and just need a more simple API for the backend to show some data, get some user endpoints. Now with Azure static websites or static web apps, it's also a great technology to host your own static web apps or even single page applications in combination with the function app. Um, unfortunately, static uh, web apps does not support any other language than TypeScript currently. That's the reason why we don't use static web apps in this demo, but instead use um, Azure Functions and Azure Storage. So the next very important part about serverless is that it's normally fully managed and it's paper execution. So we only pay for what we do. 
To stay with the example of Azure Functions, in Azure Functions there is a unit called Gigabyte Seconds. That is the actual unit of billing. What that means is that you are charged for the time that or the seconds that your function runs multiplied with the amount of gigabyte in memory that your function uses. So if your function consumes one gigabyte and your function runs for 10 seconds, then you will be charged 10 gigabyte seconds. And you have a few hundred thousand gigabyte seconds already included with Azure Functions on every plan. So it's basically free for your proof of concept and probably also for your private applications that you will run in Azure Functions. And that is what it makes, uh, what makes it really cheap. Of course, you can upgrade to higher tiers, but let's take a look at that when we are at Azure Functions. So another great um, benefit of using serverless is that it's highly scalable on every level. If, you, you, if you're using patterns that are common in serverless, like event-based routing and event-based uh, application architectures, these are normally nearly infinity scalable or infinite scalable, and these um, services therefore are also per, paid per use and you can really leverage that from a very single deployment that costs you very little to nothing to a really big enterprise application that gets scaled on demand and you only pay um, more money if you have the demand on your application. Um, yeah, that's basically the most important parts about serverless and let's go to the technologies that we actually use in this demo. The first technology that we use is SignalR. We actually use the Azure SignalR service for using SignalR as a managed service. SignalR itself is coming from the ASP.NET world, so you can also host it in your own data center, use it in your own application, but we only want to use it as a hosted application, as a, as a managed application, and we don't want to take care of any server-side management or operations. We only want our clients to connect and to subscribe to different topics or messages and be able to send messages out to our clients. So the Azure Signal R service is great for that because we can run it in a serverless mode, which is also required to use it with um, Azure Functions. But this mode is especially built for serverless architectures. And the Signal R service itself is also very, very cheap to use and it's fully managed. And in our app, we will use it for all our message broadcasting. So if a new message comes in, a new, a new thread is generated or a new comment is generated and that comment is written to the database, SignalR will be responsible for broadcasting all updates, new messages and new comments to all our clients either on web or on mobile or whatever device you're running the application or the SignalR client on. The next technology that we will use is Azure Functions. Azure Functions is the serverless offering of Microsoft for functions as a service, so for serverless functions. I already talked about FAS just a few seconds ago. Um, Azure Functions itself is in version 3 right now and uh, the major change happened from version 1 to version 2 where all workers got more abstracted. So before in version one, um, you could use more than one function worker inside of one function app. So you could run like C sharp, um, bash and PowerShell functions side by side in one function app, but not every function or not every worker was fully featured and you didn't have all the features available for every language framework. So since Azure Functions v2, um, the workers are much more abstracted and also the bindings are much more abstracted. So you can basically use all bindings with all workers because there is no dependency on the worker. It's only that the worker has to implement some methods from the runtime itself and then the 
um, output and input bindings are abstracted the same way for every language worker. This means that we can now use every binding in PowerShell basically and the current PowerShell worker is on PowerShell 6.2 um, as far as I know and um, I hope that it gets updated to PowerShell 7 RC um, or um, the release actually the, the release version very soon. So what do we use Azure Functions for in our application? So we created a new function app and as I just mentioned in Azure Functions we want it was possible to run multiple workers in one function app at the same time. But in v2 and v3 and onwards it's not possible anymore. So we have to choose our language worker or worker runtime at creation time of our function app. So we created a function running PowerShell core and PowerShell core is also different from .NET. So if you choose .NET and C Sharp or C Sharp script, it's not the same language worker as PowerShell. PowerShell is a dedicated language worker. We use Azure Functions as our main uh, REST API in the background. So our HTTP endpoints are exposed by Azure Functions. We use Azure Function um, proxies for abstracting our API to a more standardized way and we use a lot of bindings in Azure Functions and I think it's very important so I will just talk a little bit about bindings and triggers in Azure Functions because yeah it's a very important topic and it's important to understand before we go into the actual resources. So we have our uh, three or our life cycle of our um, function app in here, so now of our function process. This is a very very simplified uh, view of it but basically you have a choice of a lot of triggers that you can use. Triggers are just events from Azure services that you can choose from and that trigger uh, your Azure function and provide some information to your Azure function from the trigger. So why was the trigger triggered? Um, if there's some metadata it will come from the trigger and so on. One example and I think the most um, common example for a trigger would be HTTP. The HTTP trigger just takes a request basically and provides you with the request data or the query string um, inside of your request path in your Azure function. So you can directly access body properties, uh, query, th query string properties and so on. You can only have one trigger at once. So yeah, you cannot have multiple triggers. You can only have one trigger that triggers your function. Um, not like inputs and outputs where you can have multiple. The next part would be the inputs, inputs and output bindings. So inputs and outputs um, I refer to as input and output bindings. And the input bindings are just uh, variables basically that are available inside of your function app. So for example, you can use an input binding for a Cosmos DB. And the input binding for Cosmos DB would just provide you with a um, with a native way to access uh, Cosmos DB documents or Cosmos or one or multiple Cosmos DB documents actually. So it's very important to differentiate from the, power, uh, from the Cosmos DB trigger because the Cosmos DB trigger uh, uses something called change feed in Cosmos DB which means that as soon as a doc document changes this event gets um, on the change feed which then can trigger for example an Azure function. This is what we also use in our application, the Cosmos DB change feed. And as soon as one or multiple documents are changed in the Cosmos DB, it will trigger our Azure function and it will provide all the document IDs that have changed with this trigger. That means that we have to query the single documents because we don't get the documents itself, themselves, we only get the ID of the documents with the trigger. Then we have an input binding, like I said, input binding is a variable that you can use to interact with these documents. So for example, if I want to query a specific document, I can use the input binding for Cosmos DB, provided the ID 
and I have a variable like input document and I can just get the content of input uh, of this input element, so of this variable and I directly have access to Cosmos DB. I don't have to create a new instance of a Cosmos DB client, I don't have to handle any connection strings beside the configuration in the output itself but not in the function code and I don't have to act like it's an actual function document. So it can also be a variable where something else wrote into it. It's just a standardized serialized variable that I have available in my function app. We will see that in a minute but we have to go over some basics here. So the outputs that we have available are um, also a lot of Azure services. I will also just uh, mention the Cosmos TV output um, here because we use that a lot. Obviously we also have like HTTP outputs, that's uh, the return value that you get if you use an HTTP trigger for example, that would be an HTTP output. And as well as, um, the same as with inputs, you can have multiple outputs and multiple inputs and just one trigger. So for outputs, for example, the Cosmos DB output means that you have a variable available. So the same concept as with input bindings, just that with the output bindings, you have outgoing IO. So you can write something to this variable. If you have a variable called input document from the input binding, you can just read the content. If you have an output variable, you can write content to the output variable with push output binding, which is the standard uh, command lib for that, since PowerShell, uh, since Azure Functions v2 and the PowerShell worker. And yeah, you can just write um, JSON body, for example, serialize it, or use uh, like convert to JSON and write it into this uh, variable. You can also use native PowerShell object like a hash table and write it into there and the push output binding command that will try to parse it to the correct format. The problem with that, but we will see that later, is that there are some limitations with a JSON path thing, unfortunately. The next technology we use is Cosmos DB. So Azure Cosmos DB is a multi-model global planet spanning um, database engine. Um, it's important that it's an engine, it's not an actually database. So Cosmos DB is not referring to a database instance, it's a database engine. That is why we choose an API first. So when we create a Cosmos DB, we have to choose an API, for example, SQL or MongoDB or uh, like uh, some graph database, I think it's Gremlin. And this means that it's the same engine underneath, but so you have all the features like globally distribution, change feed and so on available, but you have different APIs to access it. To use it with Azure Functions, the only way we have really is um, to use the SQL API not the NoSQL API, so not MongoDB, but the SQL API to access NoSQL data. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but it's the only API that's fully compatible and that, yeah, will save you a lot of time when you're trying to debug this or to troubleshoot this because you've chosen uh, MongoDB in the first place. It won't work with Azure Functions, so just use SQL API and use it as before or use it as you plan to use it. We use this to store our, all our messages, so our thread messages, and as an event source for our changes. So, as I already mentioned, as soon as a new document is written into the database, it will trigger the change feed, which will trigger an Azure function for broadcasting, and this Azure function will then send uh, a message to signal R which will then broadcast uh, the, the message via WebSockets to all connected clients. We also have Azure Storage here. So we use Azure Storage for static website hosting. We just uh, generate our content and put it on our, st on our Azure Storage. Um, if PowerShell would already, already be available, I would have chosen um, static web apps for this, but as I mentioned, it's only available with TypeScript currently. The last service I want to mention here is EventGrid. So we use EventGrid for one single um, event and that is the onConnect event of SignalR. And the onConnect event in SignalR 
has an uh, event available in event grid so we can just use that to trigger for example an azure function and that is exactly what we do here we use event grid to listen for the on connect event and then connect to an azure function that will then trigger signal r to broadcast the initialize message so all current threads to our client so that the initial thread queue is filled in our client Let's take a very short look at the architecture. So the architecture of our application is very interesting because uh, until now we only heard about broadcasting but it's very important to talk about the other way around. So how does the client application write to the database? And this happens with our REST APIs. So we have these REST APIs available here and a few more here but the client-facing REST APIs are mainly our add and uh, get functions. So we have add comment, add thread, um, place a vote, like and negotiate. The first we would use, we have already seen that one, is negotiate. Uh, this will get our client the credentials for signal R, which it will then use to connect to our signal R hub. The signal R hub is, like I said, responsible for broadcasting all the messages to the clients. But if a client wants to add a comment or add a thread, it will call a REST API. And this REST API will then write the document to the Cosmos DB with uh, the output binding of our function. The change feed will then trigger another function called broadcast votes and broadcast votes will send the messages that are changed or the messages um, um, that had new comments or new messages, so new threads, to signal R and signal R will broadcast them to our clients. There's one special case and that is the on connect. I just mentioned that. So when a new client connects, it will trigger the on connect event in signal R and this will trigger event grid and event grid will trigger on connect which will catch all the current threads from our Cosmos DB and after it fetched them it will send them to signal R to broadcast them to our clients or to one specific client in uh, that case. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual resources. Let's look at our session feed service app servers first. This is a function app I have created to serve as a central endpoint and as a central entry point for all of our client applications. What this endpoint does is it serves the negotiate function that is needed to serve the initial credentials for the client to be able to connect to our signal R hub and it also provides all the functionality for posting new threads, uh, posting new comments and interacting with our application. We have a lot of functions here, but the first thing I currently always do when I visit this portal is to go back to the classic portal because the new portal is extremely bugged and sometimes, or I would say like often, it's not even possible to get the cursor in the editor view to the right position, so I cannot work with that. Just switch to the legacy view as long as there is no fix available. And let's look at our application from a timeline perspective. The first thing after the browser has loaded, so the first thing after we refresh this page or on initial load, basically, um, what happens is that the negotiate endpoint is called. After that, a connection with the signal R hub is established which will then trigger the on connect method and after that we can do whatever we want for example trigger the add thread function by using submit a new question here so let's see how it behaves or how it actually looks when the negotiation starts so the negotiate function is like the most simple uh, function you could create in Azure Functions and this is really beautiful because um, this is what like microservices and serverless architectures are all about and to have a single entity that has just one job and this job is to 
serve the connection info. The interesting part happens uh, before the code is executed, it happens in the inputs. We have an input binding of the type signalR connection info. And we don't have a trigger for signalR, that's also the reason why we don't send messages, so like threads and comments to signalR, because there is no trigger and no possibility to trigger on a new um, event in signalR, uh, to trigger a function for example. But um, there's um, this connection info input and we have the signalR output to send or broadcast messages. So what the input actually does is it um, takes a request and it serves the connection info. So we have connection infos here and uh, the connection info can also take a user ID. So the user ID um, can be provided optionally. It, um, as it can be specified here, we can use a um, template, a raw template from our HTTP trigger, for example, so like slash user ID and use that in our input. But we will not do that. We will just let our users subscribe anonymously. So let's see how this behaves. We have our negotiate app here and we can also trigger this by our own. This is one of the applications that we can trigger without any problem because we don't have to rely on an event grid trigger or something else and we get a we get an answer. So this is our connection string, so our JWT token and this URL including the uh, token, so including the access token is used to connect to signal R and to create a new connection to our signal R hub called session feed. So let's open up our developer window again and see if this actually happens when we reload the page. So we reload the page and we see that this function was called. So we have the negotiate here and we have the access token reply. And we also have the available transports for, for example, WebSockets. And then we have our WebSocket connection again. It was um, opened earlier, so you don't um, need to wonder why it appeared earlier. But we have our initialize argument here. So let's see how this initialize argument actually comes into play. So here's our negotiate post request. This is the reply. Then the WebSocket session gets created all by the magic of PowerShell and okay JavaScript in our client but yeah. <laughs> so like I said this is the most uh, simple um, Azure function you can imagine. Um, the broadcast one is a little bit more complex so we will take a look at the onConnect first. So we already, uh, already see that there is initialize. So we have two input bindings in this Azure function and we have one trigger on this Azure function. The trigger itself is an event grid trigger, so it's this one and we also use data from it and we have an input binding, sorry did I say we have two input bindings, that is not correct, we have one input binding and one trigger and one output binding and the input binding is the event grid trigger. This is really hard to uh, debug on your own or debug on premise because when you're using function call tools um, you have to use a community um, event grid emulator and that's not like the best experience but it's a pretty good program. I was just hoping that Microsoft would provide something by themselves to emulate event hub or uh, event grid events in a local environment. Just for you to know, um, maybe you can just use event grid from your uh, local function with the cloud service. That would be a lot more easier. What we do here is we have a variable threads. It's an array list and we have our user ID from our event grid data and we don't use the user ID currently because as we've just seen we uh, use the connection info to um, establish an anonymous connection but this is already a preparation if you for example want to um, 
ask the user for a username and or even make the user log into Azure AD B2C for example and then you can use the user ID to send messages to specific users which is much more which makes much more sense obviously than always broadcasting all your messages. After that we go, go over all documents that we get with the documents input binding. So the documents input binding has or holds all the documents from the Cosmos DB that we defined. And we had a very, very complex query to query all the documents that we need. Um, it's select asterisk from C, where C is just any letter. So we just get everything. And what this does is it provides us an, an, a variable called documents with all the threads available in the database and we just iterate over all the threads um, add them to our uh, array list. I would also not recommend to use the array list here but I use this array list because the payload structure is some kind of difficult with signal R bindings and there's a problem with PowerShell because PowerShell, um, the PowerShell work itself when it serializes data, it um, just does a convert to JSON, but this convert to JSON has a depth of three hard coded into the PowerShell worker. I don't know why that is. I just found an old GitHub issue um, where the um, value was on uh, depth uh, value was on ten before, and then someone said that's too deep. It's uh, the possibility that there's a very complex object will, which leads to a lot of overhead and a lot of computational overhead and our function is too high and so they reduced that to depth 3 which is... yeah. It's just uh, not enough. <laughs> so this is why we do something like... Or why we have to do something like this here. We have to first um, encode our payload ourselves ourselves and uh, we will also see this with uh, our comments array because um, yeah this can get uh, very nasty and when you send encoded PowerShell in encoded power PowerShell and do multiple serialization and deserialization you will get a lot of um, uh, challenges with escapes and uh, strange characters and so on but yeah I hope you don't run into these problems <laughs> Um, right, so we have one output binding, it's still the same output binding called signal R messages and this time we target another channel, the initialized channel and we use as argument our threads, so our uh, array list. We just uh, put this error list, uh, this array list in here, it will get parsed as this is already converted to JSON, it will not be converted again. And um, so that also means we have to deserialize it in our application itself, which I do in JavaScript. It's uh, pretty simple, but it's not nice. And if this would be another language, uh, there would be no need for that. So just that you know. So what we've seen is that this actually sends out the initial load of threads. So let's just see how that looks. So we have our user ID here and also let's uh, do a write host for every document that we run over. So let's just do write host and yes you have to do write host here and not write output. It's the same as in PowerShell classes um, but it has no nothing to do with each other. other it's just the same um, thing that you have to use write host here. Um, let's just do document dot id. Let's just see what happens and we will reload our uh, session feed instance. We see there are no threads now so that means that signal r was uh, not initialized yet. Um, it also means, oh, now it is initialized. Um, because I just saved the function it took a little bit longer. I think if we reload it again and see what happened. Yeah, now it's much more faster because um, the function was already run one time. So we now have all our threads here and we can see that all of these IDs were looped over 
And so we have all these um, available via our Signal R Hub. Great. What's the next step? So this is our um, application initialization. That is done now. But there's still one component that we haven't um, seen and that is uh, the event grid. So let's take a look at our event grid subscriptions. So this is our event subscription. It's called OnConnect. So let's just click on it. So OnConnect is an event subscription I created directly from Signal R. And uh, Signal R itself provides us some um, possibilities for these. So we have basically only two topics available for Signal R, just two events. And uh, the two events are client connection connected and client connection disconnected. We only need the connected one because we're doing some disconnection handling on the client side and we don't really care if the client disconnects because we don't have any like status or uh, online indicator or something like that. So we just filter this to um, only trigger on the event type client connection connected and we tell it to use the endpoint on connect. So let's just take a short look at our session feed, so our Signal R Hub. Our Signal R Hub itself has some metrics about the current connections, the message count and also um, the possibility to create events and this is what we actually did so we just added an event subscription the on connect and that was the one that we just looked at what else do we have so we have our session feed service and we have our session feed uh, functions for our um, function app and our session feed for static website hosting let's go back to our session feed function app and let's go uh, forward in our time travel user journey. So the next thing that would happen would be that they send a new message. So that they ask a question for example. So to ask a new question they will call the add thread method. The add thread method is um, similar easy and the only thing it does is it uses two output bindings this time. So when we take it the input and output bindings, we have an HTTP request, but we have two output bindings this time. We have HTTP and, and the Azure database, so Azure Cosmos DB. And with add thread, what, what we do is to use, first we use write host to give us some um, verbis output. I think this is from me still debugging why the um, why the date was not parsed correctly, it's because it was Unix time and I had to parse uh, the Unix time. So if you're interested in how you can convert Unix time ticks into um, a .NET daytime object, you just have to create a new daytime object with uh, 1970. So the initial date from when the Unix time starts counting and um, always define the daytime UTC and then add milliseconds and um, the amount of Unix time. So the Unix time itself and after you've done this you hopefully have the correct timestamp available. We also sent a return code of 200 and success to our client that sent the um, sent a message to our add thread endpoint. So let's see how this looks like. So we input another question. Question 10 because we are very creative right now and we see that there is a new document so uh, a new execution so this um, element was triggered I have not saved that's why we still see uh, the Unix time from from our uh, message here and um, yeah so this is this is all that happened and Let's take a look at our Cosmos DB now. So we have question 7 and question 7 has to appear in our Cosmos DB, right? So we had our output binding and we write into the threads um, object and our threads object has a few entries already and I think yeah there's question 10, it's our timestamp and yeah this is great so um, the message actually was written to our database 
And let's add another question and see how fast it can, or how fast it appears here. So we have question 10 already appearing in our uh, stream. And uh, we have the, the uh, new question, question 12, appearing there. So let's just do a fast refresh. Um, let's see. And this is our question 12 here. So question 12, it's a little bit hard to see. Let's scale this a little bit. So this is question 12. It has our timestamp and it was updated in our database. So this is what our database objects look like and this is what the functions actually interact with. So if we take a look at our function app again, to the good view and click at thread we will see that the output binding actually constructs a new object here so we need an ID if we don't provide an ID Cosmos DB will generate an ID for us and we have to provide all the uh, fields that we want to use in our database so the good thing about this is we just have this output document variable and we can just write to it with push output binding and later on we can just um, use these fields and our other um, functionalities. So let's see what happens now. So we add this question 12 and we've already seen that this triggers as expected. So just to see it a, a tenth time. the timer trigger the trigger was triggered so the HTTP trigger and it executed and added our question 14 to our signal R broadcast the broadcast function is exactly for that so if we see our broadcast function we see that we have a documents input but this is not an input this is a, uh, the variable from the Cosmos DB trigger so before we used the input and we used the um, output but we haven't used the uh, Cosmos DB trigger and this variable comes from the Cosmos DB trigger and holds all the document IDs that have changed and how change feed in Cosmos DB uh, works is that it does a trigger in a specific interval and it gives you a list of all the documents that have changed. Normally this will only be like one document because it's pretty fast um, but sometimes if you have a lot of documents changing in a, in a very high pace then you maybe get a list of documents so you have to iterate over it. And what we do here is we um, do a if documents count greater than zero so we check if there are even documents in it so it can also happen that uh, the trigger triggers but for some reason it doesn't provide documents in the documents variable then we will just write some purpose output about the document id and then we will iterate um, over all our documents so this output here just writes the id of our first document and our for each loop iterates over the documents array and does another very interesting thing it invokes another method so for this to work you have to modify your uh, function app settings because by default they can only run um, uh, the function worker can only run one azure function in parallel so if you're calling another azure function then this will call the function called uh, get thread and then this function will go into waiting state, but it will not end. So will it, it will still block the PowerShell worker. And what that means, if you're on default settings, is that um, the execution of get thread will be queued, and this function will wait forever till this um, get thread will be executed. But it cannot wait forever because this is Azure Functions, and depending on your settings, um, normally your function will be killed after five minutes. Um, if you tune it a little bit, maybe after 10 minutes, So, but that's um, the highest you can go. So um, after 10 minutes at last your function will be killed and then both functions will not execute. But the second one from the queue will execute but it cannot return 
to this function because this function already was killed. So um, this pro, um, produces a deadlock and doesn't bring you anything. So you need to modify your settings if you want to call another function from inside your function app. What this actually does is it calls our uh, get thread function and provides um, the ID of each document that is given into this because like I said, these are just the document IDs, not the documents itself. So we have to query them. And because I don't want to create a, a Cosmos DB client anywhere, I wanted to keep this as straight as possible. I created another function called get thread to get me a single document from the Cosmos DB. If we take a look at the integration of this uh, function, then we can see the document DB trigger here. We see the database name psconf, our collection name is threads, and we have a Cosmos DB connection. And this um, provides us just with an input variable documents with all the documents ID. And yeah, we have our signal R messages again, which just uh, broadcasts the list of messages that we received. So for each message, it will trigger a signal R output and a signal R message. Let's just take a really quick look at get thread because it's also a very, very interesting function. So this is the whole function get thread. And what this function does is um, it just takes a a uh, input from an HTTP request. We've just seen that. So we take an HTTP request, but the important part about the HTTP request is that um, with this request, we actually give them a uh, parameter. So we have given a an ID parameter and you see that we refer to this ID parameter here. So c.id is equal to ID. You may ask, what is this ID? Where does it come from? It comes from the HTTP request. So when we call, an, uh, call a function and uh, use a query string, we have access to the query th uh, strings inside of the pass everywhere in our function app. So basically we have access to ID as long as ID is defined in our uh, request. So we can try this by get thread. Let's, um, let's open a new tab and open up session feed again. And let's just take one random ID from our psconf thread list, so items ID, so this ID, we just copy it over and we will test our function app by giving it the ID that we just copied. So this will not be used, this uh, request header, because we are um, in HTTP GET, not an HTTP POST or any other HTTP method that would uh, take a request body. So we just do a get and use the query string, the query parameter ID with this value. And when we run this, we will see that ID gets parsed and ID gets handed over to the input binding. That's very important of Cosmos DB, which will use ID as a filter and return the exact document with this ID. So we have basically no code here. We have no actual code uh, beside the push output binding return, which we need to um, push some output binding of this Azure function, and we have output bindings. Um, we just have some parameters with our document going in, our request and our trigger metadata, which we could even remove, uh, as well as the request, because we don't need them. And we only need the document, and this document already has our final document. So we just have to return what we get from our input trigger. So again, to see how this works, we use ID here. We have used ID as a um, query parameter and that's why we already got a variable with the correct document inside of our function. We use that in broadcast to broadcast this message to 
everyone that's connected to our signal R hub then. And let's just see if this actually triggers. So we are at question 20 already, I think. So let's just post question 20. And now we see question 20 was um, already pushed to our web sockets and so into our client application. And we can also see that this function has been executed and the document was returned to broadcast. Broadcast um, sent a message to our signal R hub and that was then sent to all our clients that are connected to signal R. So same thing basically works for comments. So comments work exactly the same way. So we have one thread object and the thread object has an array with multiple functions. And uh, these um, uh, sorry, with uh, multiple comments. And these comments are just in here. So if we take a look at our uh, update thread function, this is actually responsible for updating our thread. We will update the thread with a new comment. So let's just post a new comment. And when we submit it, we will see that the update function runs. And what this does is it just takes the request and it overrides the, um, the document in the Cosmos DB because uh, when we provide an ID to our output binding of our Cosmos DB, um, it will override the document if the exactly same, exact same ID already exists in our database. So we'll just override the document, our change feed will recognize that there's a new update, our UI will automatically know because no ID changed no um, ID of the uh, the ID of the thread did not change, and the ID of the uh, comment is inside of the comments array, so that has no influence on in it. So the UI automatically recognized um, that there is a new message because there was a new broadcast from our signal R hub, and it related it to our existing message because it had the same ID and it logged up if there were any changes and there were a new addition to the comments array. So we have a new comment here and if we execute this again we see test comment number two and we will see that this test comment is just added to the array. So we have question 14 which is our um, so first of all we we seen uh, we see that there was, this was triggered again. Um, let's just take a look at our Cosmos DB this is our question 14. So question 14 now has a uh, comment array with two entries. So a new comment and test comment 2. When we now update our thread with an additional comment, this comment will also be added to the Cosmos DB. So we will just get the document again and we will see comment 3 was added to our comments array. Perfect. So, so that's it for the demo. You will find all the code in uh, my GitHub repository. I will push the code in the following days. And uh, you can find all the other stuff about the services that we used in the materials and in the session materials. One thing that I also want to mention is the ability to view your architecture and your serverless architecture with application insights. I just stumbled um, upon this and saw that uh, my application map actually shows everything um, binding related um, that I need to debug. So what we can see here, I just fill it for the last 30 days because then also my tests would be included. And it shows us a failure rate, it shows us how many calls to Sigma R and to Cosmos DB were done and um, what their failure rate was, how many instances were used and so on. And so for example if we just filter this for the last four hours so that it has our demo in it, it just so shows us um, successful requests to our Cosmos DB and the Signal R hub. And this is really helpful if you want to understand your serverless architecture and if you just want to know and to see how your uh, application instances interact with each other. Let's go back to the presentation and do a short summary of our session.
The first thing I want to give away and that's learning that I did a long time ago and always tell people that complain that uh, specific features are not available is that Azure is a framework and you can use it to solve your problems by just using maybe one or two services more. So my experience in working with Azure, especially with PowerShell, a lot with PowerShell obviously, is that you can solve everything basically. You can solve everything, maybe it's a little bit dirty from time to time, but the tools are there. And even if it's not natively supported, um, you can just add an uh, event-based architecture around it, add an Azure function wrapper or something like that, and that's uh, what I really like. Also, that Azure is really flexible in, uh, in regards to languages. So you can use PowerShell to do exactly the same things, more or less, um, as with uh, C Sharp and JavaScript, TypeScript and so on in Azure Functions. And that's also the case for many other tools. And as Azure Functions is just a runtime, you can also manage uh, things in Azure from Azure Functions. Obviously, because you can use REST APIs and as long as you can use REST APIs and, for example, manage identities with Azure Functions, you can just call up the Azure Resource Manager API or the Azure Graph API and just do a lot of stuff. The second thing is that architectural patterns apply to every language, basically. So what I mean with that is that it doesn't matter if you use PowerShell or if you use um, TypeScript or if you use C-sharp, it doesn't matter if you create a serverless um, or microservice uh, based architecture because the patterns are the same. So be careful uh, with states, um, be careful with uh, error handling, always um, look at the scalability, that it scales correctly and that is quite potent. So things like these are very important and you find a lot of these patterns in regards to serverless architecture and microservice architecture and so on in the Azure Architecture Center. I can just recommend it. So just uh, open it and read a few patterns and these patterns apply also to your uh, local script. So I think they will improve your general coding style if you think of PowerShell as a programming language and more from an architectural standpoint than from the uh, scripting standpoint of I want to get this one thing done but more in modular units of computing. And the last thing obviously as always everything is possible with PowerShell. So we've just seen an yeah, enterprise ready uh, serverless messaging application, at least uh, theoretically, um, in regards to the services that did exactly the same thing as uh, the application my colleague has written in C Sharp and it just works. So we had to do a little compromise here and there, but we can make, we can make it happen with PowerShell. So just go out there and for every challenge that you encounter, just try to tackle it with PowerShell. So in my other talk at the uh, PSConf, I talked about classes and multi-threading with PowerShell. That's also a very interesting topic that uh, no one would initially um, think of using PowerShell for that. And this is like kind of the same thing. Nobody would think of PowerShell as the first thing when it comes to a serverless backend for an event-driven architecture. But it's possible, it works, just do it. So for uh, the slides and the demos, you can find all of it in the PSCon EU GitHub repository and also my personal GitHub repository and the one of IT Insights. So if you want to get in touch, just uh, send me a message at uh, Twitter or send me an email or read our blog. <laughs> and yeah, I would love to hear from you. And if you have any additional questions, I will be available in the chat after the session. And otherwise, I will, I will be available in, on Twitter, email, whatever social or business network you're on. So yeah, just write me a message and I will hopefully write you back. I hope to see you all at PowerShell Conference Europe 2021. I hope it will be a physical conference this time. So see you in Hanover from June 1st till June 4th 2021. Have a nice day.